Welcome to Oil and Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Welcome, everybody, to Oil and Whiskey, an Ironclad Original, presented by Blade HQ. Whether you're into cars, motorcycles, hunting, fishing, grilling, or any number of things, you've got the tools that you swear by. Everybody's got those tools that they swear by. Have you ever noticed that the tool that finds its way into every job is a knife? Do you have one that you swear by? If not, it's time to get you one. Blade HQ is the place to get it. They've got knives to fit any hand, any belt, any job, and any budget. Just go to bladehq.com slash oil and whiskey to shop their selection of knives. Today, we're going to be talking with CEO and chairman of the world famous Barrett Jackson Auction Company, Mr. Craig Jackson. We're also going to be talking about our new studio and where we're actually doing this. Everybody tell everybody about watch us on YouTube now that we're going from audio to video as well. I think video and audio since... You'll be able to watch us and hear us. Yeah, both both things, right. Uh, We've also got a new In the Glove Box, and we're bringing back Truck Stop Treasures. But first, it's time for On the Gas. Time for On the Gas. Who do we have for On the Gas this week? A lot of action going on out 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 east. Pennsylvania seems to have it. We keep jumping around right in that area. Yeah, Pennsylvania's got, I don't know what they put in the water over there. Maybe it's the chocolate factory, the little Hershey Could stuff be. over there. Could be. Before but, you say it, I'm not going to yeah. let you announce this shop unless you can pronounce his name. Mark G. Hmm. <laughs> you got to pronounce his last name. It's Giambalvo. Gian Car- sure? Giambalvo. Carlos Dean? <laughs> yeah, so that's a tough one. It's a mouthful. Yeah, Mark Giambalvo. And now you can go ahead. Okay. Mark over at Creative, Creative Rod and Custom. That's a dude who's been putting out some killer stuff for a long time. Yeah. Long time. And, uh, man, everything is just so high quality. Just finished up that uh, Model A for Jerry Kerna. Um, awesome car. It was something we were honored to be a, a small part of. Did the chassis on it. And uh, such a bitching job, man. That car. Fit and finish just, on that it, thing. It, it, seemed it, was it is difficult to make a, make a hot rod stand out in this day and age and honestly probably one of my if not my favorite car at the SEMA show this past year well, just he just keeps bringing the heat man everything he does is really high quality oh, he came to play too he was putting on a show because I mean he had the thing he had everything set up he did the unveil everything was closed up about an hour later hood off hood open about an hour after that roof well, insert roof out, out. Oh, you yeah. can see I mean, but, it, yeah, that, but the Mark's, details. Mark's a cool dude, humble, quiet guy, and yep. uh, I think he's one of those dudes lets the work speak for himself. Yep. And uh, Mark I, who? Mark who? Mark G. Mark G. And I, <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate that. He's He's got some cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Building but, my Suburban, and then I just looked on his Instagram. He's got another fucking blue suburban. suburban. You realize it's not yours. He has In my head, it's mine. It's still, it's still here. You know what it's this mine. reminds me of? You know, in, in Happy Gilmore, <laughs> when Shooter McGavin takes the... the Green jacket, green jacket, gold and he's jacket. like running Boogie. and he's throwing. That's <laughs> Phil with that with with Mark's uh, fucking suburban. Phil, he's, he called he called me not yesterday, give it back. like yesterday or Monday, or whatever, a couple of days ago, and he's like, "Hey, uh, when are we shipping my uh, uh, suburban back to Mark?" And it caught me off guard. I'm like, "What are you talking about? Your suburban back to Mark? You know the one we could, we just scanned, we did the chassis, we got to send the chassis back." What? What do you mean it's yours? Did you buy it? No, but it's mine. Well, it's not yours. It's Mark's. In my head, it's still mine. It looks like it hasn't Phil. left yet. It's, it's, it does. It's the look PGS. Like yeah. It's the PGS. He's got another seventy-six square body suburban, blue and white. Now that's nothing a PGS. crazy. That's a PGS. Just a cool truck. I like his style. Yeah, For he's any, got good style. Mark's rocking built a lot out, of cool C tens over the years. Yep. Check, check them, them out. out. Oh, Jinx. Check them out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> check them out at Creative Rod and Custom. With a K. With a K. On the custom. Mark Giambalvo. Giambalvo. I'm just showing out because I you know are. his last name. Solid flex. I practiced it. Craig Jackson is the chairman and CEO of Barrett Jackson Auction Company, which has been in the preeminent auction house for collector cars in the world for the last five decades. 50 years. 50 That's years. A long time That's running. a long time. It is. <laughs> Under his leadership, the auction has developed a worldwide television audience, and his commitment to supporting the charitable causes has helped the auction raise more than $120 million since the very first. 147. Hundred and forty-seven million dollars. Yeah. I meant to talk to somebody. About Everybody that. has to keep updating the website. Uh, that's selling a, a Z06 and a couple of those. It, it, that's uh, a big number. It is. We'll it's one fifty here soon. Wow. You can follow Craig Jackson on Instagram 
at Craig underscore Jackson 427 and check out the Barrett Jackson Auction Company website at barrett-jackson.com. Craig, welcome to Oil & Whiskey. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I enjoyed my tour around the shop and uh, it's great being here. It is a pleasure having you. And anybody who doesn't know Barrett Jackson, I mean, you're obviously living under a rock. So we might have <laughs> we might have new <laughs> listeners that are just getting into it. You never know. But if you've Educate been in the industry, them on where to buy or sell a car. Yeah, absolutely. That's... Well, this is a uh, this is more of a conversation, less of an interview. We've got you know some liquid courage for everybody, and uh, sure. we're hanging Cheers. out. Cheers. Cheers. Absolutely. So we try to start at the beginning with just about every guest that we have, and and tell us. How it all started? Where did this begin? Well, the the auction started as a charity car show back in 67. My parents and Tom Barrett, it was really the Classic Car Club of Arizona, decided to put on a charity car fundraiser, but our two families did most of the work. Barrett had such a great collection as the nucleus of it. And uh, those two had met uh, previously. Barrett came from Chicago. His dad was a judge here. Really? Yes. And uh, his dad did not want him to go into selling cars, but he started selling cars and hiding them from his dad uh, at a very young age. And uh, he wanted him to be a judge, which did not happen. He ended up making a pretty good living buying and selling cars. At the time when he was in Scottsdale, he was uh, selling real estate. But he had a, a house in Paradise Valley uh, that was very well known that he kept 50 cars at his house. And he had 10,000 cars go through his lifetime. And what that meant is he had a great nucleus of cars that uh, helped the car show. And then, as we say, uh, in the early 70s, he was having a change in his domestic relations and he needed to uh, liquidate his vehicles. That's how you say it. Huh? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And uh, it was worldwide news. At the time, he had collected all the World War II leaders' cars. And uh, wow, that was uh, quite an assembly of cars. And uh, a couple famous ones from the German leader uh, made headlines. And he wanted to go around the world, get the best cars. My dad and my mom, uh, they moved to from Michigan to Arizona. My dad, give a brief history, uh, he... Went to GM Tech, he loved cars, went into the military. My mom followed him into the military. My mom worked in the front office doing accounting. My dad worked on uh, B-24 Liberators wow. as a uh, crew chief. And uh, they got placed at bases together when they came out. My brother was born in Bluxy, Mississippi. They went back to uh, Michigan and they found this 34 Cadillac in a junkyard and uh, took it to their house before I was born and restored it. And then they used to always come out to Arizona in the winter time, and then they end up moving there. My mom drove that Cadillac out, and that's one we're restoring right now. I bought it back. So that'll go into our museum. The auction kept evolving with the two families, Barrett going out and getting the world's greatest cars to bring to the auction. It used to be just one time a year, and he'd have the best pre-war classics on the planet. And you look at the greatest collections in the world nowadays and you see his fingerprints all over the world's greatest cars. There was just a book that came out rating the world's best collections. Arturo Kellers was rated number one. And when I was talking to Arturo the last time I was at the pyramids, he goes, it was Tom Barrett that forced me to buy my first car. He pointed to it and all this happened after that and he sold me most of my crown jewels. Wow. So, you know, uh, Harris had a ton of cars from Barrett Schlump Museum in France with all the Bugattis. Barrett went around the world doing that and then brought the crown jewels back to Scottsdale. My brother grew up, uh, he was 14 years older than me, which gave me a broad demographic being around this. I grew up at his race shop and uh, he used to race. He used to. Uh, go to Riverside, Stardust, all that. He became good friends with Phil Hill. They went to Europe together when they filmed the movie Grand Prix. And uh, they spent three months over there. And then when he came back, he went with him around the US when they raced the uh, Chaparrales. 
So I got to meet all these guys at a young age. I bet you thought that was cool as shit. You I mean. know, it was babysitting for him. So he had to bring his annoying 14-year <laughs> younger <laughs> brother along. At My brother drag raced also, so I spent a lot of time out at Beeline Dragway. I spent a lot of time. I got a lot of pictures at Riverside, Stardust, going to all the west side, west tracks. And, uh, you know, my dad loved French classics. So when I grew up in the shop and grew up restoring cars, uh, primarily French classics, but I worked on race cars and uh, I, I got an affinity for the muscle cars because my brother, his race shop had all these, you know, 1968, 69, 70 muscle cars in there and babysitting back then for my brother was throwing me in the back seat. We'd go to the drag strip or go cruise central with his annoying little brother in the back seat. Uh, it gave me a well-rounded view of cars. Those are two opposite ends of the spectrum. Absolutely, <laughs> two opposite ends of the spectrum. But as car collecting evolved, it, uh, it, it gave us a good idea as to where the passion is. And when my uh, brother passed away, I, I sent a questionnaire out to everybody, and I asked, what should I do? You know, what can I improve? And they were like, well, you need to change the mix of cars. You need to make sure the cars are for sale. You know, back then we were primarily all reserve auction and I changed it, started heading towards no reserve. That's when Steve Davis came in. And uh, I had a goal and that was, I wanted to turn the auction into an automotive lifestyle event, not just an auction. Part of the questionnaires was, you need more stuff to do. You guys go from early morning to late at night. Sure. You need stuff to do throughout the day. So I kept adding things on and put it on television. This first, So I took over. My brother died September 28th, 1995. I put it uh, speed, launched that January 1st of 96. We did tape delay that year, three hours Friday, three hours Saturday. Ratings were phenomenal. It was only a three hour delay. They just didn't like, go live live because they had just launched the network. They're sure. like, really, two weeks in, I'm going to go do a live event. But it came off very well. Uh, next year, 97 on, we've been live ever since. Uh, we've been on the internet since 94. I built our first website. And uh, my goal was to bring a lot of new people in and make it much broader than just guys that pick up back then Hemmings or Classic Car Magazine to bring awareness to people as to what car collecting is all about in its entirety. And it keeps getting broader. It's not, you know, when we first, I grew up, it was the brass era cars and the classics. Sure. And then it branched out into the 50s cars, became very popular. And then we were the first ones to start selling the high-end muscle cars. And I started collecting the high-end muscle cars back in the 80s. My dad told me I was out of my effing mind what I was paying for these <laughs> cut-up drag cars that uh, I was piecing back together. And, uh, you know, I said, I grew up watching these cars. I go, these are the S.J. Duesenbergs of our generation. And uh, the hot rods be started becoming uh, popular. They got parked after the 50s. They started coming back out in the 90s into the 2000s, and you know they started to become more popular. And then customizing cars became more popular, and then that became quite a craze that uh, really brought in multiple demographics across the board. Uh, good guys branched out. You started getting more things to go do with your cars, yep. and we just sort of look at where trends are going and try to keep adding things to the auction with our seminars and our experts looking at the cars. So people that don't know anything about cars can come there and buy something. Sure. Not that we're guaranteeing it, but we're doing our best job anybody can to vet the cars and describe them accurately. Doesn't mean every car is a numbers matching, even if it's in the, you know, the stock configuration, but we will do our best to verify it. But if it's not, we sell it for what it is. But now we actually have to have a, a uh, expert on resto mods because guys will buy a yeah. car and they'll say it's got this and this and this and we'll look at it and go, yeah, it really doesn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 the game has really changed. We've watched the evolution of it too and watching the numbers match in Hemi muscle cars and the 454 is just bringing you know, insane money and it seems like it's really transitioned into the, the resto mod stuff has just been great you, there. You remember that time of that like, mid 2000s 
you know, and I know us, I, I was coming up, you know, Bear Jackson was like the non-biased media company that was giving legitimacy to what we were doing because yep. you were so used to either good guys or NSRA or any of these other publications. And it was great to win an award there, but it, it was great to be in one of the magazines and stuff. But at the same time, it was always kind of like, well, yeah, but that's our thing. When Barrett Jackson started running, you know, it was kind of a transition from the salon cars mm -hmm. and and putting some of those high end pro touring street machine of the year winners. Some we sold had sniper was one of the first ones. Trepanier's build. Then we started selling the cars, the junkyard dog that uh, boy yeah, built. Boyd did. Sure, that you was know. when everyone in the industry was kind of like, "Oh, we've made it! Like we're <laughs> legitimized yeah. everything. We're well, being taken you know, serious. They're bringing yeah. two hundred and fifty thousand uh, exactly. back. That was a lot of money yeah. for a fifty-five Chevy. But that had to be a gamble on your part at it that was. point. You know, Steve and I had a lot of discussions about it, and he's like, "You know, I think the trend's going there," and I was like, "You know." We, we already irritated everybody running high-end muscle cars during the middle of the day. Let's go for it. <laughs> so, oh, well, it's cool to see the progression and to keep your finger on the pulse and keep looking absolutely. at what's what's next and what's moving forward. You know, you know, I grew up and I, you know, I tell people that we're selling passion, and you you got to sell to people what people want, but you also have to educate people as to what the options are. And I know a story, one of my uh, competitors sold a ton of Ferraris to a guy, very high profile guy. And one day he was in the middle of uh, a very busy intersection and the carburetors overflowed. And uh, he called him and told him, come pick them all up. I don't want to drive any of these things anymore. I'm in the middle of a very busy intersection in LA. Every time I take it out, something happens, you know, and it, you got to use your cars. You got to keep up on them. You can't just let them park and drive it every so often. I have a full guy doing that. A resto mod's a lot different, though. Hey, sure, you shouldn't let it sit forever. The gas will go bad. But if it sits for a few months and it's on a trickle charger, you go out there, unplug it, hit the key, it fires up and drives. You don't have to worry about timing it to where you can get to the next gas station that has 110 octane leaded fuel. It runs on pump gas. Uh, my wife, as we did the Fast and Furious car, you know, she drove it the first time before we put your chassis under it to Cars and Coffee, came back, goes, I hate it. I love it, <laughs> but I hate it. It doesn't stop. It doesn't turn. It overheated on her. I go, it's a, it's a movie car. car. <laughs> it was a movie car. So we took that great, uh, you know, body lifted up put your chassis underneath it general motors worked with us on the drivetrain we made the engine it was an ls but made it look like a 427 yep. hid the coils and all that put a torquer on it and made it look like a real old school big big block and now she loves driving it That's so great. it stops it turns it starts all the time uh it does everything you want it to that's always our goal. It's uh, it's not to please the customer, but to please the customer's wife, because <laughs> car guys they're used to dealing with nuances and because in the end that pleases the customer exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if we can do that. We are doing a, we're doing our job. You know, Ed brought back our road rallies, and it's yeah. almost all custom cars on there. And you know, as the boomers are aging now, we still I still love my numbers matching muscle cars, and got some of the best ones out there. I think. And I love them, but I'm not going to drive a thousand mile road rally in one. I'm it's just certainly not. not. I'm going to drive a resto mod. And uh, I think you're going to see more of the rally starting to become a, hopefully a little bit more user friendly on that. Because yeah. a thousand miles in a car, we were talking my Pontiac, what shocks sure. put on it. Uh, one said it turns nice, but also doesn't ride like a stagecoach for exactly. a thousand miles. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's because that's that's a torture test. And like you said, you're not going to take a 426 Hemi Cuda and go drive a thousand miles. You're probably not going to drive ten miles nowadays. They're, those cars just aren't what you remember them to be. But that's you know, always what it is. A guy, I'll sell him a, a numbers matching car, and they'll call. He goes, "This thing does this and that, and that." And I, you know, yeah. a lot of times we'll go drive it. You know, if he's a local guy or if he complains while well, some guys drive it away from the auction drive it back and uh, sure. i'll drive it and i go i hate to tell you but it drives exactly the way it did in 1970. <laughs> yeah. they're not fast <laughs> they you don't know. stop they well, make they, a lot of noise and they and they look cool then you got the guys in their you know early mid 40s or whatever that 
want that, but never they didn't experience that it. They never originally. experienced yeah. it. And they're yeah. like, this is going to be so badass. And that first time, you know, they convince themselves that it is badass because you're not going to, you know, have that letdown. But then, like, the third or fourth time, or when the wife comes out and stuff like that, and you're just like, yeah, this is not fun. You know, it gets too hot or it overheats. It does whatever right. it's going to do. Even the guys that grew up on them and, like, you know, driving regular cars for 30, 40 years afterwards, like, you get into, you know, your run of the mill Toyota Honda, it'll probably. Yeah. Beat an LS6 Chevelle in a drag race, and that changes the memory a little bit. Yeah, after you've been you driving so many some, creatures. Some were you're actually used to. cool, some weren't. I had a Boss yeah. Nine, and I had a local guy beef it up, and he goes, "This thing's gonna be blistering fast." I took it out. I was like, "It's a pig." Yeah. <laughs> it did because we didn't put headers on it; still couldn't breathe. But we did uh, compression and did a hotter cam in it, and you know, made it as good as we could from those huge ports into the exhaust, and tried to make it breathe with still having it look stock. Uh, some of them were really cool. You know, ZL1s and L88s, they uh, they get with it, but they got tires about that big on them. Uh, That's what makes them feel fast. Yeah, because you know, you're just, just sitting there sketchy. smoking the tires. <laughs> right. We did a recent thing with Little Red and the Hornet where I took them out and I drag raced them. And uh, I laid probably 900 feet of rubber with Little Red <laughs> through all three gears, at least three football fields. <laughs> Uh, you know, like Carol says, can't have too much horsepower, just not enough traction. Yeah, that's you know? right. <laughs> it, cool. Nowadays, you got traction, turning, air conditioning, Bluetooth, you know, uh, all the creature comforts, and it looks cool. Yep. Yep. Do you think more of the prices at the auction are being driven up from the usability, drivability, or the kind of one-off cool, unique factor? I on think it's of both of them. You know, and I think as you look across demographics, uh, boomers, but we're selling them all the way down to Gen Zers that are getting money. And, uh, you know, it's not just Japanese cars that they like or European cars. They still like that American muscle look, but something, and they like something that they can tweak and tune and uh, add all sorts of stuff to and make it unique. So it's partially unique, it's drivability, it's the cool factor. And it, it really transcends generations. And I can't tell you how many people ask me, you know, what car should I buy? And I, my main thing is, are you going to drive it? Yeah, I want to drive it all the time. Okay. Well, it's interesting you say it transcends generations because that's something else I was going to touch on. That Hats off to you and the whole staff at Barrett-Jackson. But it's interesting when you talked about your you know, beginnings and your, your dad's you know, background and love more of the French stuff and then your brother doing all the muscle car and the drag stuff, which it explains a little bit about how you've been able to, I understand it's easy to say a car guy's a car guy, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you've been around long enough to know that that's, that's a fairly generalized term. Not all car guys are created equal. And the guys that are hanging out at Pebble Beach or doing Brass Era stuff or doing, you know, salon cars and stuff like that mm -hmm. is not the same guys that are at, at Columbus, uh, good guys, or the guys that are building, you know, C10s that are on air ride, no. um, or even the Gen Zers that are looking, you know, for, you know, whether whatever it be in their wheelhouse now. But being able to make a place where everybody feels comfortable and mm -hmm. they feel like they've got to be there, like yeah, it's not it's, it's not a place that's, that they feel like they're welcome at with their deal. It's the fact that if they're not there, they're missing out. That's what I mean. Seriously, it's, a, it's difficult to do. Well, it's yeah. a place, you know, we want to be inclusive. Everybody should be welcome. You know, and I go back to years ago, uh, you know, it's amazing. Guys, idols of mine, you know, coming up to me at the auction, Bob Seeger one day, and I didn't even recognize him because I've been watching you on TV and I finally oh, had to cool. make it. Here. Didn't tell us he was coming. <laughs> wow. You know, uh, Guys that Billy Gibbons stops in all the time, and he loves hot rods. He loves, but just seeing them be car guys and people not even bothering, just walking by, you know, a cool car. Oh, there's Billy. Look at that one. You know, it's yeah, uh, that's cool. That, that they're is, cool because right. they just when you're there, everybody asks us every year who who's coming, what celebrities, this and that. This year, I could have told you two, three that I was knowing. 50 some pretty much wow yeah uh great and they just come because it is all inclusive and sure. you don't get bothered and people whether you run a company or you work at a company or you're a rock star you share one thing yeah you love cars and the camaraderie uh i had one guy tell me uh, it, it was one of our main sponsors 
And uh, we were doing a renewal and we were talking back in Michigan. And he goes, you know what really hit me is he goes, one of my neighbors came to Scottsdale, went to your auction and came back and he goes, I wanna thank you for sponsoring Barrett Jackson. He goes, why? He goes, cause when I go there, I realize that I'm not that weird, that there's a lot of other guys <laughs> like me yeah. that are car junkies. <laughs> and when I'm there, it's all my fellow people. We come from all walks of life, all around the world and we congregate there and uh, magic happens. It, it's a great atmosphere. Yeah, it's a, a great crowd. When you talk about the celebrities, it is interesting because when they're out there, th they kind of drop the celebrity aspect because mm -hmm. like, you, they're not out there because they want to be out there signing autographs or making an appearance. They're car guys. So that's the place to be a car guy. One thing that's amazing is some of them don't even tell us they're coming. Buy a ticket, come in. Sure. And, and I'll, see him, <laughs> I'll see him out there. He looks yeah. familiar. You know, I could have taken care of you. <laughs> yeah. uh, We've used it a bunch of times, and we don't talk to a ton of celebrities, but just, you know, real high net worth customers, a few celebrities, a few football players. Like, people will ask that aren't in the industry, oh, what was it like talking to so-and-so? And, like, I know you've used it. I've used it. You've used it a million times. Like, ah, they're just, like, cool car guys. Like, you're just sitting there shooting the shit talking about cars. But, yeah, yeah. it's kind of being what a, it is. And a car it's like everyone lets their their guard down yeah. and being you, a car guy transcends all that you yeah. don't you don't run into many car guys whether celebrity or not that are just completely you know douchebags you know <laughs> I mean, for not, not that often no. you know? Yeah. And Very even, even guys that have a persona like david spade grew up in scottsdale and he comes in the studio and does his pieces he is absolutely hilarious but when he's out at the auction he is focused on cars that's cool and He's one of those guys, I saw him walking around years ago. I was like, why don't you tell me you're coming? I'm, like, yeah, I'm just here hanging out with family <laughs> and you know, I'm be low profile. It's like, well, let me know next time you come. A couple years later, I see, you know, he's posting that he's at the auction, never asked us, just comes in. And, but then you almost respect that more, don't yeah. you? Yeah, I do. He doesn't want anything. He just right. wants to be a car guy. Yeah. I mean, you've got people lining up probably looking for the special, uh, you know, I remember me. Oh, I hear it once a year. Yes. <laughs> My once a year phone call. <laughs> hey, how you been? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is this again? <laughs> oh, we get uh, it at every car show. We got a stack yeah. of tickets. We got to run out to the front gate. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Here you go. Do you, you talked a little bit about Little Red. What was the what's the story behind that? How you found it? How how that came about? Well, it's a great story. So Steve Davis was involved with getting me the Green Hornet. Green Hornet was in line the second car. These two cars are very special because they were development cars. Little Red. Go back to the start of the story, and then I'll tell you how we found it. Little Red was built when Carroll came back from Le Mans. He ordered the car. Uh, and uh, it was uh, built uh, towards the uh, end of 66. And uh, by January 67, he had the car assembled. And uh, it went through many versions in its lifetime. And I'll sort of get to that at the end. Uh, it's partially why it was hiding in plain sight. But it, uh, Carol ordered three cars. He ordered a fastback. Uh, a convertible and a notchback, and he wanted to build GT 500s. Because prior to that, they were just building GT 350s. These were cars that he wanted to put, he ordered it with a 428 uh, with dual four barrels on it with air conditioning. So just that way in a notchback was a rare car, the only one. Uh, so he then, proceeded to sh turn it into a Shelby. Uh, after we found it, we saw that it actually had crayon markings all over it saying Shelby under, even after sitting in the sun all that time. And uh, it was one of those mythical cars. He put two blowers on it and t pumped it up to 600 horsepower. And uh, everybody knew that it was gone. It was crushed. It was a famous car back then. There were articles written about it. Uh, it wasn't crushed. Uh, it was turned into a 68. We have all the notes. Uh, all three cars were reskinned as 68s. But the most famous pictures of it were out at Riverside. The other two cars are in the background already as 68s. It's still a 67. And that's when the journalist borrowed it and got pulled over by the police, uh, outrunning the police, leaving Riverside, <laughs> wrote an article. So... 
it was supposed to be crushed. That car also was the test bed for many parts, but also the California Special was derived from it. Uh, Lee Iacocca saw it at Shelby, put it on a TWA car plane, shipped it to Detroit. The Deuce saw it, said, yeah, produce them. I like it. It sold very well. They made the California Special. They made the uh, uh, high countries up in Denver. And uh, then they decided after that they wanted to make a nationwide version. So they made a prototype and lime gold, which ended up being the Green Hornet. They decided not to make a nationwide version of it. This is in 68. They then gave the car to Shelby Automotive. So those that don't know the Shelby story, Carol wins Le Mans 66, 67. And then uh, Ford took total control of Shelby, moved it to Michigan and uh, turn it into Shelby Automotive. Wow. Uh, that part, if they finish the story, is sort of heartbreaking. But uh, so Little Red was the only coupe, the only EXP 500 made, and it was the only one ever made in LA at the hangars. And so I got the Hornet from Steve Davis, they had found it. Again, it was hiding in plain sight, said EXP 500 on the side of it. And it was sold at a lot in Detroit, at an actual uh, Ford lot for employees. They took off all the experimental parts and sold it. First guy that, the guy that ran the lot took, drove it and uh, said it had too much horsepower gave it back and sold it to another gentleman. <laughs> he didn't deserve it That's anyway. Not a, car, not a car guy. <laughs> and there's pictures of it sitting in the snow, gave it to his son, the second owner, and uh, drove it. And it still said EXP 500 on it. <clears throat> Make a long story short, because it is a long story, and there's two documentaries on our YouTube channel about uh, the hunt for Little Red and the legend of the Green Hornet and a lot of outtakes. So. In the middle, we found uh, uh, through a mutual friend and Shelby expert, uh, Brian Stiles, he uh, told me there, there's a guy that's going to rebuild the Conlig fuel injection for the Hornet that he can make it run again. And another guy who's the son of the guy that did the independent rear suspension in the Hornet can make the independent rear suspension. I got a hold of Phillips, who ended up restoring it, and gave it to him. And then uh, in the middle of the restoration of it, we were getting paperwork. I was working with Ford and Brian Stiles and all those people. And on one inventory sheet, there was a VIN number for Little Red, a Ford VIN number. Everybody was hunting for it by its Shelby number. So we ran that through a private detective in all 50 states and got a hit uh, and got a name. Then we went on Facebook and found a guy sitting in a 65 pedal car. And we're like, that's our guy. Called him and he's like, do you, have a, do you still have a red 67? He goes, no, I've got a 68. Yeah, well, okay. Do you have a car that has VIN number so-and-so? Well, yes, why do you want to know? He goes, well, we think it's a, he goes, you think it's a little red, don't you? And, well, I called SAC and <laughs> they said expensive. it was crushed. <laughs> Both owners of the Hornet and Little Red, both had called SAC. SAC told both of them the car had been crushed. So we fly out there, cut a deal with the guy, make a long story short, it was not an easy negotiation. Do you go out there personally? Yeah, I did. As soon as your face is seen, that price goes up, doesn't <laughs> you know, it? <laughs> and he had already Googled it. He had already <laughs> saw the Hornet. He knew what it was worth. Uh, so we cut a deal. As part of it, I'd finally bought a GT three fix uh, GT three fifty R black that I wanted that Richard had, and I drove it out there and I traded him a brand new <laughs> GT three fifty R in cash for a beat up car in the middle of a field with no engine, <laughs> no front end, uh, and uh, we hauled it out on a trailer, and uh, wow. it was hiding in plain sight. Then we went and found the original owner got the story of how he bought it and where. Then uh, the current owner at that time interviewed them. Then we started really going back. So then we finished restoring the Green Hornet. And when we stripped it, we found that wild candy apple. They'd never stripped all the fiberglass. So wow. under it was all the original candy apple green. And uh, the, in all the jams, you could see the original lime gold under it. So then at the auction in 2019, 
And it was sort of spontaneous. I was up on the block and I'd been thinking about it. I bought VIN one of the new GT500. And I afterwards I asked Edsel for two favors. I go, <laughs> and is everybody that runs the factory is there. I go, can you paint it the same as the Hornet, which was right across the way? I go, yeah, we could do that. You see the shop manager. Yeah, like, <laughs> shit. Oh, I'm, I'm well aware about the promises that people make. <laughs> That's when I sell a chassis. He goes, you it's guys can do that, right. cash you. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, I go, and the second thing is, because I showed him my book and all my research, he goes, you're into this, aren't you? I go, I am. I can't tie together how it got out of Ford Motor Company. I need to know how that happened. I go, I need to get into the archives. So he allowed me to go into the archives. And uh, Brian Stiles had told me, he goes, follow the accounting. The accounting will lead you to the pot of gold. So I got into the accounting department back then of the de of getting rid of the show and the experimental cars. There's a whole file on getting rid of all of them, one file. And it had how they priced them, the memos to take all the experimental stuff off of them, the car, Little Red and Car 100 and the 68 Conleg car, which I ended up buying, all were sold in Littleton, Colorado as a group. And now we interviewed the original owner who went there and saw the car and actually asked him, why does it say EXP 500 on the side? And they go, it's an experimental car. He goes, are you allowed to sell this? He goes, well, Ford shipped it to us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he drove it for a while. And the stories are hilarious. He gave me photographs. And I go, what did you use it for? He goes, well, I used it as a utility vehicle. Well, what does that mean? He goes, I went hunting and fishing in it. I go, what'd you hunt? Deer, antelope. <laughs> Where'd you put the deer? Well, that little thingy on the back of the of the trunk there. <laughs> Made you a just, good deer you just, you just he heave the deer up there, and they don't move much. <laughs> I used to take put put a Christmas tree on the on the roof uh. at Christmas time, and you're using the most uh, rare Shelby in the planet to go hunting, fishing, get your Christmas tree. He goes, it was a family car. We drove it eighty thousand miles, uh. and it had EXP on the five. 500 on the side of it, but it was a 68. It had been reskinned, and everybody thought it was a just a 68 coupe that somebody had added this stuff to. So we brought it back to its glory. And while we're doing the show and doing all this, when we tore it apart, it had all this 1968 one-off prototype parts. And we went to the guy that designed them all, and he still had all the blueprints of all the original prototype parts. And he... When he'd make two, he'd make a third one. And we all these things, he, we'd show him the thing, and he'd go get it out of his thing, go, yep, that's it. Wow. So we that's tied crazy. all this together. That, that is quite and then a story. Through crowdsourcing, we launched it at the uh, Henry Ford Museum with Aaron Shelby there and uh, Henry Ford III and uh, the SAC uh, people. And they all thought I was just going to talk about the Green Hornet. And behind the curtain, I had Little Red hiding there. And while we were restoring the Green Hornet, we pulled the curtain back. We found this, Little Red, <laughs> and uh, let all the Shelby guys come uh -huh. and look at it unrestored. And then the next day at Woodward, we launched crowdsourcing. And we did it on social media, media, everywhere we could. Anybody that's dad, grandfather worked for Shelby America that would remember this car contact us, created a website, created a Facebook page just for it. One guy writes in, he goes, it's crushed. My dad built the car. He knows it's gone. All right. You know, we had other guys. I got the engine out of it. I know where the real little red is. You know, you get all these, you're like, all right, a lot of conspiracy theories of going course. on here. About two weeks later, same guy goes, my dad, I showed him a picture and he thinks it actually could be. Can he come look at it? Well, we had the car in Arizona. He retired to Arizona and worked for Brickland when he re when he retired from Ford. Brickland's had 351s and he worked on the drivetrains. So we have it sitting in my man cave and he walks in and sees his car and it was just like, wow. It's, so we sat him down and he told us the story of putting the blowers on it and it was, Ironically, after hearing his whole interview, when we sold the Super Snake the last time at last March Scottsdale auction, 
I put it out on all the media and the guy that built it for Carol contacted me and we went and filmed him and he told me the same exact story. Wow. He goes, go to the parts department, get two packs to blower kits. Don't tell any of the Ford guys what you're doing. It's for me. Go into my private area and build me my car. And both guys that worked in two separate areas told me the same story. He goes, I want a car. My friend beat me in his Ferrari. I want to kick his ass in this Cobra. That's That's why he built the Super Snake. And the same guy said, he goes, coming back from Lama. There was a lot of rumors that Little Red was painted Ferrari red, and we found it. We realized it didn't, but it did have different carpet in it. The original owner said it did also. It had leather seats in it. So he sort of thumbed his nose at Ferrari by putting Ferrari carpet in it and that put two blowers on it. But he goes, I can go out and eat Ferraris for lunch in this thing. <laughs> so, you know, that's sort of the story of Little Red. It was a that's mythical neat. car. Everybody knew it was crushed. The Hornet was so unique because Ford Advanced Vehicles, who built the GT40, put the rear end in it, put the multi-port computerized fuel injection in it. Oh, wow. In 1968. Damn. And they built two of those, and I own both of those now. And actually, we were supposed to, I was supposed to look at it. Film crew went and filmed it on the dyno yesterday. So we've got those two, both of them running, with the son of the guy that designed the original fuel injection, had all of his blueprints. He's an electrical engineer, followed in his dad's footsteps, re-backward re engineered it off the drawings and, and all of that, and built Damn. all the parts. And I had enough parts that were still came with the Hornet for him to finish the uh, being able to put them all together. So that that's the that's long story on two very of those cool. very cool cars. Yeah. But And I take them out and drive them and smoke the tires on them and have fun. And go deer hunting with them. Yeah, hey, I haven't <laughs> gone like deer hunting yet. Roof. Maybe the 68 yeah. version just for Christmas. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll throw a Christmas tree on it and drive it home. <laughs> But, we got to uh, start doing hand-fabricated deer carriers in the back of cars. There you <laughs> go. Oh, I'm I'm sitting here thinking this whole time of of all the story, all like you said, the the PIs and the detectives and all the work. That, but as many years as you've been doing this, how do you weed? Or I guess you got a full staff of how do you weed through the real of you've got to have people contacting you on a daily basis of like I've got this, this one of one of one never before seen. You've got to you need to see this car. Yeah. yeah, some of them are wild goose chases. Some I end up with rare cars. Uh, you know, you got to return phone calls to people. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of letters written to me. And, you know, I got Elvis's first car. Well, I sold it twice. So I'm not <laughs> sure you actually do. Unless you bought it. <laughs> hey, if, if a guy's writing a handwritten letter, he's serious. He's got some old shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it's a handwritten letter. <laughs> or he's from, in prison. From Memphis. Yeah. All right, let me give this guy a call. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, what's uh, what's some of the craziest stories you've got of, as far as auction cars? Um whether it be memorable or, you know, wild story, something. We'll get to Rick Hendrick's stories in a minute. I want to add, just from personal, I want to, there's got to be a good story about him. But as far as car-wise, it could be charity stuff. I mean, some of the charity cars stuff, like. I mean, <coughs> the excitement's we, there, man. That is wild to see. I'm not, I'm not too, too afraid to admit. I get, I get emotional sometimes. You see, see I mean, <laughs> see it, a little it's tear in Josh's yeah. eye. A little bit of tear. And maybe allergies make me cry. But, you know, <laughs> there's, I mean, seriously. This, oh, it's uh, crazy. cool moments. But, you know, you go through the top moments at Barrett-Jackson, uh, selling the F-88, having a guy get in a car and tell the other bidders that he's buying it and they can't afford it when you got two billionaires bidding on it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, selling the Howard Hughes car was another one at Palm Beach. Uh, both these, we used to do a reality TV show, Life on the Block, and the other day I was watching a couple episodes, and one was the F-88 and the other was the Howard Hughes car. You know, the Howard Hughes car, my brother had uh, gone, right? My my brother's wife worked for Hughes Air West, and everybody there knew that he uh, he was a car guy. And when Hughes died, just a few days later, they contacted him from Sumacorp and said, would you be interested in buying three of oh, Mr. Wow. Hughes's personal cars? So he goes to 7,000 or Main Street. They open up his vault. And Hughes was a weird guy. Uh, two of them had these germ boxes in them. One was a convertible for one of his girlfriends. And in this room, my brother said, 
All the reels from RK Studios were there. There's a mannequin with the jacket that he wore when he flew the Spruce Goose. He's like, can I buy that too? No. no. <laughs> uh, but he goes, all of his personal artifacts were in this room. And this room was uh, so that the car, he was the only one that had access to it. And when you read, then I got onto reading all the books about Hughes and the sex FBI guy told a lot about it. Uh, the Buick was a very special car. It had a germ box in the back, a 24 volt. Uh, What's a germ box? I'm sorry. I, I don't from care. a hospital, it had an actual uh, hospital air filter in the back yeah, to filter like out germ germs. Yeah. It only could bring air in through the germ box into the inside. The car could be parked running off the batteries. The 24 volt aircraft motor ran a, uh, a electrically, which is no big deal nowadays, but back then, they had this whole setup to run the air conditioning, and he used his portable office. It had was built by Hughes Aircraft, and after you know multiple stories. So you're saying you know guys kept saying no, it wasn't built there. It was built here. I'm the one that did this. He used to have two huge scoops on it, attract too much attention. So I said I'm going to wait. We sold it quickly. Uh, we were offered the car back. I bought the car back. Uh, my mom and I did. My brother didn't want it. He's like, I already did that. All right. So I said to my mom, we're going to wait until, Av uh, we didn't know the movie, but we knew that there'd be a movie <laughs> oh, yeah. about you. So we waited till Aviator came out. And then we put it in our Palm Beach auction. And we had no idea what would happen. And two guys lined up on it, Ron Pratt, this other gentleman. And it's one of those things where it's creeping along, it's creeping along, it hits half money. And, you know, these guys go back and forth, it hits a million. And then we're at thousand dollar increments. And one guy's telling the other guy, he goes, it's Ron Pratt. You got to hit him hard or he's going to, he's going to kill you. He's telling him, hit him at 250, you know, hit him at half. Oh, I'm not going to spend that much, you know, and they go back forth up another quarter million. Then Pratt hits him at 250. He's like, just, you know, <laughs> wow. And the place just goes nuts. And my mom and I just couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, that was a great story. Great car, great history. Does that happen a lot? You get all the way up to a million dollars and all of a sudden it just goes in thousand dollar increments? No, they're trying What's to, the you know, uh, I, I, people have different strategies. I always tell people, if you want to buy a car, go at it. You know, let everybody know you're serious. Uh, you'll nickel and dime it and you'll end up paying more than if, you know, it's a $700,000 car and they're at 500, go to 700. I think Kevin Hart figured that out what, yeah. a year or so ago on that vet. <laughs> you got to get in there. <laughs> yeah, you got to go for it. You got to swing for the fences. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, selling the Batmobile was probably one of the most iconic uh, TV moments for us. Uh, you know, having George Barris sit up on the top of it and driving in and the whole crowd from outside to, uh, we got the rights to play the, the theme song. We killed the lights in the room, put the bat symbol up on the, the ceiling of the tent. And uh, I don't think do anybody it. listening realizes it before the, the amount of work that's going in this. This is three dimensional chess at all these different <laughs> levels to just run a car like of that promise. Oh, like yeah. you said, getting rights to this and getting this guy. In. Man, it's, there's. And you got to choreograph it all and cue. The only thing which we do now, we didn't do then, you know, we had a security guard there to stop air from the outside coming in. And you've watched the video and you see him in the sea of people going backwards as the crowd comes in <laughs> and uh, they couldn't, he couldn't stop. The whole outside came in and the bidding goes back and forth and uh, you can't make this stuff up. Two guys, one sitting right in front of the other in that sea of humanity are the two high bidders. Then they stand up and look at each other and they tell each other, you know, how high are you going to go? I'm going to go to 10 million. Well, so am I. And they go back and forth, <laughs> eye to eye, for $2 million. Finally, they, and we got a ringman in there, and we can't see anything from the block. There is a mass of humanity. And the only way I could see what's going on is I'm watching the speed, the monitor of TV, and the handheld guy can, and I'm like, well, there's two guys looking at each other. Well, they just flipped a coin. <laughs> and they flipped a coin for who would end up being the the one to take it away. They're like, well, this is insanity. We're going back and forth. So they drove it through the roof first and yes. then flipped the coin. And then flipped the coin. You so know. next year you pass the rule and there's no coin flips. You got to bid it to the winner. <laughs> no talking to the underbidder. Exactly. Separate them. You know, there's so many great moments. George W. Bush being a surprise guest coming there and uh, selling the charity car. Uh, you know, we've had so many great charity car moments. Uh, 
Rick Hendrick being uh, such a great customer, buying so many of the VIN ones, uh, you know, just been an honor to raise this much money, but also awareness. You know, my wife chaired the heart ball. We did a whole campaign driven hearts. This was what brought me to tears. So this one, Dave Ressler had given us on our 35th anniversary, a 35th anniversary Corvette white and gave it to us on Sunday afternoon, live on speed, asked my mom and I to come to the block. We didn't know what he wanted to do and said, here's the keys. You've made so many great moments. You make so many people happy. Oh, wow. Have this car. He did the same thing at the 45th anniversary and gave us a 45th anniversary car. Uh, so my wife is in line to do the heart ball. Dave drops dead of a heart attack. And uh, we said, you know, we said we'd never sell the car, but maybe we'll sell it now for the Heart Association. So, yeah, this one's this one's a tearjerker. Mm. We, in the middle of doing all this, uh, Mr. Mousy dies, and Greg was a great guy, helped us with so many. He was the one that originally started the he would buy it and give it back, and he did that for Richard Petty, for his wheelchairs, for veterans, so many times. So we pulled the car up there. I had my daughter drive it up because she learned to drive in that car. Oh, and awesome. uh, uh, Dave Ressler's daughter drove up in it. And Mrs. Mousy buys it and gives it back. We're all like, oh, this is nuts. <laughs> Sells it. We sold that car three times. Sold the car in Palm Beach. Sold the car at Mohegan the Sun. It made the lap. Car raises a million dollars. It's a you know fifteen thousand dollar book value vet sure. that Not raised anymore. a million dollars, That's but awesome. it uh, it made so much awareness that uh, just the media hits on it were over five million dollars worth of media hits because it just went viral. Wow! So sometimes it's not just the money; it's the cause and what you can help. And we had so many people because we really were pushing for the symptoms fast. Uh, what the acronym means and some people writing in I I was having a stroke and I didn't even know it but I learned it by watching wow. Barrett Jackson I'm hmm. like, here wow. we are we're just happy you're putting some pro touring cars on it back in the yeah. 2000 no, right. now I feel you're like a big, the world. I feel like a huge piece of shit <laughs> <laughs> nah, it, it, you know <sighs> selling cars is is part of it but building a, a a community is really what we've tried to do and set standards and and vet the cars and and have a fun place for us car guys to go have fun. Yeah, there's commerce in the middle of it, of course. but our opening night parties kick it off. It is it is a kick in the ass if you've never been to Barrett Jackson. Well, hats off to you on, on, for many levels, but as far as like you said, putting on a show, we do we've done a lot of car shows all over the place, and it's generally that four o'clock time comes. You know, you've been out in the hot sun all day long. You're ready to get back to the hotel and, and relax a little bit, but out there at Scottsdale. I mean, it comes nine o'clock, ten o'clock. I mean, it's you're still having a party, and oh, it's yeah. fun. You don't want to be anywhere else. And you're, you're afraid going you're going to miss five, out. Six days in a row. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, Billy Gibbons. One day he goes, "You know what this is? This is a rock and roll concert that never ends." <laughs> he goes, "I'm used to two hours. I've been here four days, twelve hours each day." <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the bars hey, don't hurt either. That's no, sure. it helps. It helps keep you going because <laughs> yeah. if you're there all day, yeah, you yeah. got. Yeah, he's created a hell of an atmosphere where there's, like you said, there's just countless things to do from the the ride-alongs, all the OEM cars, all the lifestyle pavilion stuff. You see some of the coolest stuff. We're always blown away every year at oh, yeah. all the stuff that they have, all the vendors that are there. Yeah, you bought that eight-foot golden bear <laughs> for your front of your yard, too, last year. Yeah, like All the OEMs debut yeah. and all their latest stuff. It's just everything you could possibly want to look yeah. at is there. And I've got plans to take it to the next level. So we call it Barrett Jackson 1.0 was my dad and Tom Barrett. And I did version 2.0 for the past 26, 7 years. The next generation of it, I'm going to kick it up a notch now before I retire. So well, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You any teaser on that? Any little spoiler alert? No, where, I'm where just going to add more <laughs> lifestyle, more entertainment, more celebrity, more uh, interaction, more TV. I got a, I got a little, kind of stuff. little insider information that says to ask you about a new show, Future in Collector Cars. Is that something you can talk about? No, it, what it is is we bought ClassicCars.com, and it has that. We want to do a show that is more geared towards 
the Japanese cars, the European cars, the 90s, 2000s type cars. Uh, we'll do that on the soccer fields by Westworld. Uh, we're, there's a lot that's going to happen to Westworld and that area uh, building that's going to go on that's going to allow us to expand more. How so. many how many keys to the city have you gotten from Scottsdale? Do you have like a whole <laughs> ring full of them? No, usually I'm the uh, ugly stepchild. It's like uh, they're just used to us coming. Every so often, I'm like, you realize I bring a Super Bowl of economic <laughs> impact every year, every year, even during the pandemic when everybody else shut down. I was still here. Yeah. I figured it out. <laughs> we stayed open. Yep, you did. <laughs> yeah. Did a great I, job. I, I would say, you know, I looked at the people that just went and hid. We did. We were safe, but we figured out how to keep moving. And uh, I, I thank my sponsors, my customers, and everybody stuck with us. And we came out of it and so, hit a hockey stick. Well, I, I guarantee you, it was, it's perseverance. I mean, you you haven't gotten to where you're at right now. I mean, I'm sure there was hard times. I'm sure there no, there's was difficult. been hard times. You know, I grew up in a body shop working on cars. So I just look back thinking, you know, I always thought, you know, just beating on fenders and fixing cars. And anytime it's a bad day, I just remember it was 110 degrees out sandblasting a car in the sun going, you know, it could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's better, though. You know, I'm sure you have well, days where I was you're in like, my own I world wish I was there. out there sandblasting <laughs> yeah, it absolutely. on those headaches. You know, there's, <laughs> there's times that you just think a life was simpler, but you also realize you didn't think you'd get these opportunities. Of course. And no, I absolutely. appreciate these opportunities, and I appreciate my customers. And we are a family. And we think of it that way. Barrett Jackson, our staff, the whole team, uh, it's not for everybody. Either you last three days or 30 years with me. So you're <laughs> you're either built for it or you're not. <laughs> That's cool. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna elaborate on that anymore, but we we know that. I mean, it's the hard we talk about it with pretty much every guest on the perseverance and the hard work. It's it's fairly easy when you think about it and it's quick to see if somebody has it or not, you know, you see it, you know, and if when the going gets tough, you know, well, I got to go home. It's five o'clock. <laughs> We're ready to grab a gear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you're, you're short shifting in the second and leaving. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's yeah. not made for being part of this team, yeah. this team, you know, we want to have fun. We want to have time with our family, but when it's go time, it's go time. And there is no clock. Oh, I can imagine. It's obviously a tremendous amount of hard work has gone into creating what you have. That's uh, just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, hats off to you for sure. It's it's it answers a lot of questions, knowing the backstory and knowing how many different you know uh, backgrounds and stuff that you've had. But I'm still just yeah. I'm in awe. I, I'm. I've probably got more questions now after sitting down you know, than I did before. Like talking about working on my Pontiac. I mean, I have a full metal shop. I grew up as a metal fabricator, but I don't have time to do it all. And that's why I was like, you guys are the best at what you do. You guys give me the bones to take my first car to where I want to take it. I'm going to take it from there. That's, that's a huge yeah. honor. <laughs> it's an honor, and it's awesome to work with somebody like yourself. I mean, chatting with you a little bit when you're out in Scottsdale, I mean, I was absolutely blown away by your background your hands-on ability and i don't think a lot of people know that everybody knows you're a car guy but i don't think people know that you can pick up a spray gun or stand behind an english wheel and and build just about anything that's yeah, out there I so i can tig I, and mig and run a power hammer and an english wheel and lead and i grew up with guys that were in their 70s and 80s and taught me all these skill sets before they died i'm glad that it's come back I mean, I watch some of these YouTube sites of these guys that are masters now. And I mean, I'm just like watching, going, wow, the craft continues. It yeah. is. But learning shrinking and stretching and how to build bucks and all that, I learned from some pretty old, crusty guys. And, uh, you know, the masters, there's still masters out there. But you guys are keeping it alive too. But the second lace is on life. And, you know, it's. People ask me all the time, is it going to be over soon when the petroleum car ends? No, they're going to be, you know, electrification. We're going to be building two, 3,000 horsepower oh, electric yeah. uh, Personalization will, will never go away. No. We'll, we'll evolve. We'll build hydrogen powered. I don't care what's exactly. making the wheels turn, but it's going to be cool and it's going to have 1,000 horsepower and kick ass. Yeah. Whatever's <laughs> under the hood. <laughs> and we're working on that right now. I mean, we're, we've already got chassis designs with some EV stuff in it. And just like you said, if it goes fast, 
We'll evolve. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. It'd be like Tim Allen. He built his and he, he put music to it. So he goes, I'm not going to put phony sound to it. He magnified the sound of the electric motor. Sure. So that it <laughs> whines when something. he schools, <laughs> spools up. You know, you got to keep moving ahead. And uh, my Pontiac, maybe the next light life cycle for it, we'll put an electric engine in it. Sure. You know, it's my first car. I'm going to keep moving ahead. And people always ask me, you know, what's the next collectible? Well, they're building them right now. Yeah. The end of the petroleum supercars, the last of the stick shift cars, the first of the hybrids. This is a real pivot right now. And uh, the one-off customs that are being built in shops all around are works of art, just like they were back in the 30s with Fagoni Falashi and Bowman and Schwartz customizing cars and LeBaron. You know, it's just people want something unique and cool and different. That's what I think drives the passion. Well, Craig, it's been awesome. I know we've kept you way longer than what you wanted. I know your your wife's probably going about to beat the door down here in just a second and say, "We got to go." We got to go. We, we got we got a couple more just very quick standard questions that we ask all the guests. Um, favorite car movie and why? Ah, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I went and watched the Gumball Rally at a drive-in and had a ball doing it. So I loved that. It, it had humor. Uh, we've sold a few of the cars out of it. I would say the second Fast and Furious movie, because my wife has the car. I love Paul Walker, too. You know, there's so many great ones. And I love Gone in 60 Seconds, too, with Nick Cage. And uh, that's That one's come up a lot. Of, a you lot know, of them. It's it, a fan it, favorite. It yeah. is a fan favorite. But recently, Rush was so well done. Uh, you know, yep. uh, Senna was so well done. Sure. Yep. So, you know, they're still making great movies of the of the guys that were icons. You know, Fat Ford versus Ferrari is also another great one because yep. I'm close to that one. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you, that's right. You, you watching that one to knowing all the background. Knowing and stuff all like, the background of what, yeah. what's actually happening behind the scenes, right. knowing Carol so well and, you know, knowing the Ford family so well. Those are all those are all good ones. Come, they come up a lot, actually. Yeah. Uh, I would. The next one is actually an easy one. It's the what's the first car you've owned and what's the best story about yeah, it? But, but we've got it. We've got right the out first got car. It, yeah. the best story about it. I drove it. To, my mom drove me down to the DMV the day I turned sixteen, and I went and got my license, and I drove it home and went to the Roundup drive-in that evening and on a date. So. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's solid. pretty cool. That's pretty. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, the one that we do with every single guest. This is the first one we've ever done in studio, in person. And this is going to seem like a really awkward question. I don't know if you've ever listened to any of these. You've got to do a pocket dump and show us what's in your pockets right now. <laughs> I don't think there's anything in my pockets. You've been traveling. I've been traveling. I just traveling. changed my pants. Hey, that's, that's fine. <laughs> not a big deal. Greg, it's been absolutely awesome. It's been great. Uh, honestly, I've, I've only said this a couple of times. I think you all would echo this. We're going to have to do this one again because... I think there's more questions to ask now than there was before we started. Oh, you could we could go on for a lifetime here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I love cars. I have 80, well, maybe 90 now in my collection. And, you know, people ask me, you know, what do you like? And I like what they're making nowadays. They're making some cool stuff. I got a Z06 on order. I can't wait to get that. Uh, you know, there's just, this is going to keep going. And uh, What do you think of the new all-wheel, they're doing a new all-wheel drive one, aren't they? The yeah. hybrid? Hybrid. That's next. So, you know, I know sort of what's in the food chain coming. Um, of course. But the Z06 being that aspirated overhead cam, uh, you know, flat plane crank, yep. uh, red line of 8,700 RPM. That's, cool. that's going to be cool. After that, they're going to add electrification after that, or turbo and then electrification. So it's going to keep evolving. It's going to spool up and what used to be Bugatti horsepower only, you're going to see that domestically coming down the road. I think they haven't told me, but I'm I'm reading you know, between you know. the lines. <laughs> what's, what's the number one car in your car collection? You got you got to have some awesome stuff. But what's you know, the one, one of you my won't first ones with? was the the purple Hemi Cuda convertibles. One of my favorites to drive the Veyron still. You know, it is a kick in the ass. You 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 put the pedal down on that and it thing goes. and uh, it, it goes. Iconic Little Red and the Green Hornet are uh, very special cars to me. But, uh, you know, 
restoring my first car is going to be probably it's going to be up there it'll be up there i kept yeah, it all cool. these years for a reason no pressure no pressure. <laughs> no pressure i'm getting nervous i'm starting to sweat over here a little bit <laughs> and i'm glad i waited though because originally i was going to put a ram air 4 in it uh and then i found a super duty 454 engine i was going to put that in it never got around to it you know when i was making this decision i was like should i just jump to the electrification it's like nah. I'm gonna I'm gonna first put, you know, seven hundred ish type horsepower yep. engine in it and trick it. I can always electrify it later. So first, let's make it kick ass on petroleum, and we'll we'll either hybrid it or electrify it next. That's awesome. But I'm it's never going away. It's in my family. It'll be in my trust and my museum forever. Very cool, Craig. It's been awesome. It's been a pleasure. We're gonna let you go. I appreciate right. it. It's Thank been you. awesome. Big thanks again to Craig Jackson. Remember, you can keep up with all the cool stuff going on with Barrett Jackson Auctions by following him on Instagram at Craig underscore Jackson 427 and at Barrett-Jackson.com. That was actually a really good episode. That was great. And don't forget to follow the uh, build progression on his 67 Lamonts. Absolutely. Yep. They get started, get started here soon. Also, get all the fucking papers off the desk because it looks like shit. <clears throat> this is a tremendous amount of papers. This is a video portion now. I don't know if you're aware of that. It looks like we're fucking busy, man. Looks yeah, like we're, we're doing, doing things. Yeah. I got, I got, we got files, guys. This Finally is way more files, files than you have. Yeah, you got a manila folder over yeah. there. Next up, we're bringing back Truck Stop Treasures. Bringing them back, huh? Yeah. I, I'm Phil ever prepared. Wait, Phil's prepared. Phil brought something. I brought one. Ah. Go ahead and uh, check out that top drawer top right drawer. there. <clears throat> top drawer. This is a surprise to me, too. You'll remember. If we got... Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is... Uh, Truck Stop Treasures. We're actually... That the is a last... piece of apparel right there. I'll give just a little hint. The last time we did Truck Stop Treasures, it had to do with basically the greatest American hero, Dale Earnhardt Sr. This is true. Uh-huh. This uh, falls right in line. What do we got? Start with the story or just break it out? However you want to slice it. You go ahead. I, this is your uh I came across treasure a here. gem here. I'm gonna have to, <laughs> gonna have to see you wear it for the rest of the rest of the night. Can we pause the camera and then we can. Bam. Yeah. They can do uh, some we were, editing. We were coming back from Louisville and we stopped at multiple truck stops trying to find some truck stop treasures. I think we were forcing we were trying too yeah, hard. Was, yeah. Yeah. Phil, it came organically for yeah. him. He found a so we pulled into a shitty truck stop. <laughs> I think it was a Stuckey's at one it, time. It was one of the ones that had like you know, random ass signs. It was like three different things. This and, is what, yeah, yeah, this is, it used to yeah. be a Stuckey's. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> I know it's good. <laughs> Out in the middle of nowhere, nothing around it, off I 65 in Indiana. That's the best place for them, too. Yeah. I figured there'd be some gold in there. So I sprinted out of the truck to be the first one in. I came back with uh, a Hunt Brothers pizza. Which is delicious. Yeah. Some of the finest road dining you can get. <laughs> Hell yeah. And then off in the back, there was a little display stand with a few pieces of headgear. What'd you get? On that. You got to take, oh, you got to pull the you headphones, gotta off. headphones off. Right. Right you got to you gotta show the true fit of this thing. Right now this is when is... they do some creative editing. <laughs> and all, that's all with the black shirt today, too. <laughs> This is wow. genuine synthetic leather. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Old number three. <laughs> I've got to see what that looks like. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> uh, Holy shit. Uh, you look bad. I can't put the headphones on. It's going to ruin it. No, you can it still works. see it. It actually no, works it, pretty serious. good. Does it? Yeah, yeah. it's not bad. Yeah, it it covers, it, yeah even the threes. The three shows up. Yeah. Oh, the rest of the. Praise the hell, praise the Dale. <laughs> uh, so, I-65. We were north of Indianapolis, right? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Stop into what used to be a Stuckey's is now <laughs> just a truck stop. Go all the way at the back. You too could have yourself. Yeah, Phil a, snagged the a, only one though because I was in there shortly after and I couldn't find. I anything. stuffed it under my shirt, checked out, and ran to the truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Phil's I, in, the, I Phil's I in the gold. Num- I think he's just, he's in the number one spot right now. Phil is winning it right now between that and I his know. knife. Let's yeah. not draw attention to <clears throat> it. Shit. Here, you want to wear it for a little bit? I don't want to mess up the rig. That's, you know, I, I know fancied I myself up today for Mr. Jackson. So I oh. I'll take it off now. My head's sweating. <laughs> Synthetic leather is not that breathable. 
Well, I thought that was genuine leather. Yeah, no? for three ninety nine, I'm sure <laughs> yeah, it was genuine, genuine leather. It's genuine, yeah. Oh, well, that'll do it for truck stop treasures. These are these are rare because we don't we don't just force truck stop treasures. Yeah. We've got to actually come across them organically. You truly can't just buy anything. We went no. the the two before it. We looked at we looked at quite a few blades. Yeah, yeah. There were what else? We were going to buy the oversized Zippo, the fifty cal lighter. Yeah. I was I was close to yeah. buying that. And there was a fifty cal uh, little folding knife. Yeah, oh, there blade. was there was the majestic Wolf cigarette container. I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That one was. I was it just real, didn't feel, real it just didn't feel no. right for me. You should have no. got it. Yeah. That's hard. You can't yeah. go to like a mainstream big name truck no. stop because it's too. Yeah, it's fake. just cheap shit. Yeah. You got to go off the beaten path. Yep. So. Well, this show car season's coming around. We'll be traveling a little bit more, so hopefully there'll be some more truck some stop more treasures. All right. This segment is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. The Formula One racing season is going strong, and next up is Monaco. Get in with all the action on DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, new customers can place their first bet of $5 or more, and if your bet loses, you'll get a risk-free bet up to $1,000. If Sportsbook's not available in your state, you can experience the thrills of racing on the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports app. So, that that's the whole fantasy betting league deal, that if you live in a state that online gambling is not available, the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports app is for you. You can compete for your share of over $100,000 in prizes. Don't miss out on all the action this week at DraftKings. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today. Use code ROADSTER, R-O-A-D-S-T-E-R, at sign up. New customers can place their first bet of $5 or more on the race, and if your bet loses, you'll get a risk-free bet of up to $1,000. That's code ROADSTER at DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, what do we have this week? We actually... This this episode is just crazy because everything is a, a little bit on. different. There's a lot going I feel, on. I feel disheveled. I know, but that's fine. We're just going to roll with it. It's been a busy it. day. We're going to roll with it. <laughs> Instead of in our pockets, yeah. right, we're going to talk about where we are. So the, our in the glove box today is actually- Where are we? The, the box studio. that we're in. What a box it is. It's a, you've got a great <laughs> box on you. This, uh, hey. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said that wrong. Yeah, you did. I apologize. Uh, brand new studio, right? Brand new. Well, yeah, brand is took Chris the place. Christened it tonight. This took the place yeah. of our uh, previous conference room. If we have some good <clears throat> pictures of what that was, do we, we, do we anybody you get can before go, pictures? We'll you can try go to get some before and after. You can go to YouTube and watch the Jesse Greening episode there and you see go. where we were at before. We, right where we were sitting. Yep. In the Jesse. That's, Same place. Phil is sitting basically where I was during Jesse Greening's. I'm we, very close. In short time, we turned this place around into. When uh, you say uh, we, it was definitely we. We, it was a, yeah, it, it, it takes a village, really. It yeah. takes an entire team to do what we did here. And we had to send Phil away for like a week. He went on vacation to not see. Well, we did, it, we did it fast enough that the credit card statements didn't come <laughs> through yet. So if you can get it done in under a month, yeah. you cut the checks, you ring the credit card, and then bam. And then you deal with it afterwards. It's right. like, what the fuck? Yeah, I had no idea. We have engineers, <laughs> painters, machinists, Oh, we forgot about that part. Yeah, outside of just the things we bought. Parts guys buying shit left and right. Yeah. yeah. But look at what we created. Yeah, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's what... what I enjoy that process of cre- you know, the creating yep. process and seeing what guys can do. And it, we kind of empowered all the departments in the shop to do what you see here. And everybody stepped up and really performed and had their hand in it. And, uh, you know, it kind of started with the three of us sitting back, kicking around some ideas. We went one direction. Ironclad one, went one direction. Phil purchased what? What do you call those? The uh, uh, vintage service merchandiser. Yeah, old school mechanic bench. So he kind of inspired what you see here, and we, I guess, scaled it more or less. Oh, we knew when we started the podcast we wanted to go to video, you know. Yeah. And it was it, even at that point it was scratching heads of like where, what, what does it look like, how's it set up, you know. Obviously, we had to have Ironclad's expertise as far as like you know you could make a really cool space, but if you can't you know, film in it, then it really doesn't matter. Exactly. But, uh, you know, once the kind of the, the, the I guess the organic, uh, very raw idea was there, then it was uh, kind of easy to turn it over to, you do well with was, Chris so of well. saying, hey, like I'm going to brain dump a lot of stuff and you just like make it look like it's sure. supposed to look. So this is basically like building any one of our high-end, likable, 
hot rods, some of our home run cars. I think we need to have a build thread just on the we studio. We should. I know Chris took a bunch of pictures, but just seeing everything behind the scenes is pretty cool. It, it is very cool. This started with a concept, the three of us putting our heads together and coming up with something and then uh, kind of relaying that information to Chris. And Chris, our Chris Gray, our lead designer here, he put together a really cool sketch, kind of laid out the proportions of this. And then it uh, shot its way over to the chassis shop, went through the engineering department because obviously we can't just cut that stuff by hand. Oh, we no. need you know, we need a binder about yay <laughs> thick yeah. full of prints and laser cut parts and machine parts and 3D printed parts. So Noah over there in uh, engineering, he rocked this thing out and uh, sent it over to Kyle. I think we got to show the pictures of like the behind the scenes. Oh, it's crazy. The, I don't know. No, no, no. yeah, nobody wants to see yeah, behind the scenes. Right, it's crazy. It's, it looks it phenomenal. It, it but wasn't, yeah. and now it is. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's all you need to know. But I, just seeing think, how it's built is more impressive than it the is. feature. I yeah, I, it's a but, huge thanks to the guys. The guys had a lot of fun with it. Everybody in the shop played a role in it. It was great. Everybody working together. It, it was, and seeing, uh, you know, I think Spencer he uh, is used to working on some pretty high end cars down there, doing some pretty cool uh, sheet metal work and fabrication work. So. You know, he cut his teeth on all sorts of homeowners things. He's a younger guy. So now <laughs> this will serve him well when it comes to hanging a TV, trimming a baseboard. Spencer you know, did Spencer, great. He was he cut it up. On man. a he, Tuesday, he was he was rolling sheet metal, you know, and he was hemming an edge and he was using the spot welder, you know, was. and creating that, you know, 50s vibe. And then on Sunday, he was here with me and we were up on the ladder. We were doing OSB and, you know, a sound deadening and, you know, doing anchors in the wall and hanging pictures and oh, everything yeah. there was. And Scotty, he played a big role in that. Yep. He did a lot of that sheet metal work. And you can't just break the corners. You got to put a nice ra radius on it. And then well, we, of course. We got a cool new spot welder here. So we were able to roll some offset beads, spot weld some stuff. And uh, yeah, went through the paint shop. Enrique, he, he banged it out. He was under the gun. Always falls on the paint shop, right? Yep. Whether it's a car or a wall unit. <laughs> <laughs> Comes down to the paint shop, man. But uh, yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Josh, obviously, he's our detail guy. So everything you see in this place, down to these microphone stands, it's got Josh's little touch on it. So that's off to Josh for project <laughs> managing the whole thing and making it all happen. Couldn't have done it without a great group of guys. It was oh, fun yeah. working together on something that you know you had a. It, it's a little different when you know there's uh, one. There's a, a very short deadline, and then you know you kind of have to have it done. Oh, so yeah. you, when there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know everybody yeah. can kind of bust it out and, and work and together. Then, you know the way we do things. You can jump on any website. There's, there's a variety of websites that you can buy these cool uh, illuminated liquor shelves. <laughs> that would have been but, so much yeah, easier. But why the hell would you buy the $250 pre-made wood with acrylic? Do you know why? Liquor you want you know the real reason. I know. Tell the real reason. It's because you have we OCD. needed. No, we needed. We needed uh, 41 inches. Yeah, because I didn't want to see a gap inside <laughs> and the, of it. They thing. only make them 40 inches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so that, that half-inch gap on the oh, yeah. side so that, that you can't see now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you had that that vision of uh, you wanted to illum illuminate them a certain way. Yeah, I didn't want to see the light. So flushed into the center of them, you know, we ran like a data blade right down the center of yep. them. They're flushed in. And then, uh, yeah, the best part about it is getting to see one of my favorite things is Sunday morning homeowner Josh. So you know, <laughs> Josh and I worked together. We ripped a lot of boards and did some stuff here at the shop. And then he put the finishing touch on it. So you get to go over there and you see the typically the sleeveless T-shirt. It's Alabama uh, Josh. I mean, it's, and I love, man, I love shoveled that. Disheveled hair. Yeah, yeah. A little, little, Alabama little, little Josh bit Josh shitty means, looking. He know? means business. Yeah. Some wide leg cargos. <laughs> yeah. There's tools all over the place. Yeah, it's, I love it. Uh, but yeah, hats man. off to everybody, man. This came out so cool. Uh, big props to the guys uh, responsible for making the centerpiece right here. Yeah, look yeah. at this. Thing, that, man. Yeah, this is a this is a absolutely badass. This is a All American Reclaim right over here down the road. Yep. Yeah, Barrington. This Lake is, Barrington. Uh, and this is for Micah. What is? Yeah, this is uh, a <laughs> this is vintage Reclaim for Micah. This is actual railroad car flooring. Yeah, it's cool. It's thick as shit. You ever, yeah, so, yeah, they knock this. I wonder up. where it's been. This was the thing is, well, Phil was there. You Phil, you weren't there. Phil, I missed Phil out it was that. me and Phil made a little excursion. We knew this guy had the the material, right? And they also have their own carpentry shop and some badass carpenters yeah. in house. A lot of cool, all kinds of reclaimed lumber. <clears throat> They're responsible for the door as well. Oh yeah, the door is amazing. It's off camera, but it's a badass door. So it was a standard go in there and it's like, you know, I want to buy some of that flooring, but uh, that railroad car floor, but we want to make a table out of it. Well, we actually do that. Yeah, I know. 
so I'd like to get one made. This is the dimension stuff. Okay, no problem. Well, we're running about 10 to 12 weeks right now. Like hell you are. I said, well, that's, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> uh, I'm going to need to talk to somebody that can make those decisions because uh, I don't know if you know that's this. This is not going to work. This is a pretty big deal podcast <laughs> that nobody's ever heard of. And you don't know what it is, but I promise you it's a big deal. Uh, so they did us. They did us a real good favor. Uh, knocked this thing out and, and couldn't be couldn't be more impressed. Beautiful piece of. And at the end of the day, right after everything's done, we've got a new announcement. This is actually the last podcast we'll ever have because we <laughs> we blew our nut on the studio. <laughs> oh, we can't forget the awesome wall wrap. You know? Oh yeah, what a cool picture. I think that's a is that a Rob McGaffin? It is. It is. Shot? It is a Robert so McGaffin. So photo shot. credit goes to Robert McGaffin. It's down there in the corner. You just can't okay. see. It's off we camera. We snuck it in there. We <laughs> should have put it on one of the little menus up there. That would have been a good idea. Yeah, Dog and Suds right down the street from here. Yeah, we shot that. But uh, just a car we all loved. Nice. I get parking credit for it because I parked the car there and then Rob took the picture. It felt I, like I never, all I never you, get really. the parking credit. You parked the hell out of that car. Thank you. Yeah, so nice I mean, the camera, the camera and you parking it really did all the work. Cameras, Robert just yeah, pushed just the button. took a fucking picture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but 70 Chevelle we built for Matt Saxon, now owned by Joe Rogan. Sure is. One of my favorite cars. I know it's uh, it is my know, favorite Phil's that we built. number one spot. I'm hoping that the uh, that the the quality of the podcast will will continue to grow now that we're in a more creative space, I feel a more good comfortable here. space. Yeah. Some good. of the ones we've been doing during the uh, construction, I mean, we're all huddled around a desk. You sat in my lap, I think, for two of the episodes. I did. So that was a it, which weird. was weird. There was a lot of seats. I don't know yeah. why you wanted me to do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you're running the show, so. <laughs> uh, don't want so to upset Josh. <laughs> that's uh that was our pocket dump. That's it for yeah. tonight. And uh, next up is, what are we drinking? This is a another special thing. It is. There's, there's nothing about this episode that is normal. We're going to have to end after this because it's, it's a pretty high bar. To it is pretty high. Yeah. So what are we drinking? And explain where we got it. So we picked out a, uh, a bottle for this special uh, we did. evening. But uh, Craig, Jackson, Craig Jackson showed up, and this is not it. But this is a Jefferson's Reserve Pritchard Hill Cabernet cask finish. And... Craig Jackson was nice enough to show up and gift us with this wonderful bottle of bourbon. He said, I'm coming on oil and whiskey. I brought some whiskey. And I think his exact words was, let's get hammered. I think right. so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With a fist pump in the air. Yeah. I think that. And then it was a few like shots. That's like that much of the bottle went quickly. <laughs> so, but uh, I love all the Jefferson <clears throat> stuff. And thanks for Craig. Thanks to Craig for bringing that. Uh, I've kind of cut my teeth on the Jefferson's Ocean. Yeah. I was a big fan of that. Cool. Years ago. Uh, cool story, cool bottle. I, I've never had anything bad from Jefferson's. It's all great stuff, and this is right there with it. Uh, phenomenal bourbon and uh, extra special that it was gifted to us by uh, Mr. Jackson. So Before we give our reviews, do we get a couple of, is it like 0. .2 additional because it came from It's Craig? almost a full point, dude. Really? Yeah. It's graded on a curve. Well, let's yeah. do it. Everybody knows the rules. It's time to 1 to 10. What do you got? I like it. It's a buyer. It's it's definitely one to buy, um, and generally very fairly easy to find most places. Yeah, not now too the bad. Pritchard Hill is a harder one to get. Is it? Yeah, the regular Jeffersons is available. This is the aged. In, is that the cab cask? Cab cask. Yeah, yeah. Jefferson's That's a nice flavor. Jefferson's is another one of those that I wish they'd change the shape of the bottles because there's so many good bourbons they offer, but it's the same and shape. You don't want to read. You'd rather just know I want the tall bottle. Right, or the I like short to bottle. look at shapes. Yeah, I do. right. I don't, don't want to read things. So. <laughs> I'm gonna go seven seven six on that. Is that a review? It's, that feels good. It's a review. Feels good. Go seven and a half. Going seven yeah. six. It's it's one of the what's Phil's the, going what's seven five. That? That's a that's a one hundred like, proof. Hundred proof. Yeah. The drink the is zero. it hundred proof? Drink smooth. Oh, you just called. You just you said just that. So I believe. Yeah, it's like everything. When Josh says something, I'm just like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. it was 2022. I stopped it and 2022, said 40, 90 proof. Yeah, it's light. Okay. Which and it tastes light. It's smooth. Um, yeah, I don't know how to describe that like finish. Can somebody put that in words? I can't. It's got a yeah, interesting, unique flavor on the tongue. Almost a little nutmeg. It's just flavor, if you will. Flavorful if you will. Yeah. would be the way to put it. It's. Not a lot of I'm length. going with a 7.5 as well. 7.5? Yep. Solid. Yeah, that's a good cluster right there. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Good that looks grouping. like hey, that looks like one of your uh, shooting clusters, you know? We go to the range and you guys put and them all in that nice little, clusters. nice little cluster and then I'm all over here. But we, we grouped that <laughs> we one. Did. Kinda, we did. Yeah. We grouped it good. We grouped it's that called nice a group. Is it, it is. grouping? Yeah. Not yeah. a cluster? No, it's a tight no. group. All right. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. 
all over the place. What a great episode. Yeah. Fun night. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Oil & Whiskey with The Roacher Shop, an ironclad original. If you like the show, I, you got to like this show. I don't care if you leave any good ratings. You don't need reviews. to watch one after this. this no. This is just kind of the... And this this is all different now with the ratings and the reviews and the algorithms and YouTube is and there video. All that, where do you find all that stuff? Oh, you just it's you just you it's on the web. You I don't it? find it. No, okay. Ironclad just tells me about okay. it. I don't <laughs> find any of it. I'll be honest. So it's quite possible that it just sucks. Yeah, it might it might really suck. They just keep telling us we're doing okay. good, but I don't know if anybody listens. Maybe I get a few texts and emails. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's Palatine Mike though. That's your neighbor. <laughs> There's your shout out, Mike. What Pal up? Does Palatine Mike know he's Palatine Mike? Yeah. Okay. He's well aware he's Palatine. All right. Yeah. Palatine Mike, this episode's yeah. for you. <laughs> you <laughs> we haven't met yet. I want to meet Palatine Mike. We need to meet him. Uh, if you like the show, be sure to leave a rating review. Download it wherever you get your podcast. Check it out on YouTube now that we're going to video. Thanks again to our guest, Craig Jackson. We'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.